And on we go with the next. We are up to book nine, which I had mentioned earlier, but didn't have a chance to get to because these videos have to be very short. Um, in the spotlight, volume three, in the beginning. So there came a point where I, I thought, well, maybe I've talked about the end times enough for the time being. So let's go back to the beginning. <laughs> let's talk about where it all started. So this is actually a chapter by chapter, verse by verse, word by word, line by line in Genesis 1 through 3. In the beginning, this was fun to write because I got to go through the days of creation individually, talk about some things that are kind of related and tangent, some of the other weird ideas that are out there, um, and kind of tell why they're not true. Like, the flat earth. <laughs> I, I very, very briefly touched upon that, why that's not even possible based on the language that we're given in specific days of creation. And I hate even bringing it up because I don't even want to stir the pot on that. But this was fun to write um, because it goes, it takes us all the way back to the very beginning, obviously, and how, how everything came about, God's plan, God's intentions toward us, what went wrong, why it went wrong, everything and, and what happened as a result of it. So uh, chapter one is called Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth and then we start uh, in the beginning, Genesis 1-1. And I do address the gap theory, why that is not possible, uh, why there wasn't a universe, how it wasn't remade as, as some people think. Um, Genesis alludes to like there was an original creation and that was destroyed and then it was remade and everything. I address all of these I'm just going to say far-fetched uh, and unreasonable. I understand that a lot of people might disagree with me and say that there's biblical support for these things. There's not. I go to the book of Joel or in that book of Job also and discuss all of these other little things that people use to say certain things that just don't fit. And when I say they don't fit, I mean that, that God is very specific and intentioned toward us and he's not going to introduce arbitrary vague things. There is no gap. Everything started on day one at day one with words spoken. I literally go word by word through these three chapters. So we start with rightly dividing. Talk about in the beginning, Genesis 1-1. Is there a gap between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2? No. Talk about how that's not possible. Then we go evening and morning were the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. Each of those individually, chapter 10, is made in the image of God. That's important because we're actually introduced to the Trinity in Genesis 1. Uh, let us make man in our image. So then God made man in his own image. God is a triune being, which is why it says, let us make man in our image after um, our likeness. So anyway, uh, the Trinity is actually introduced in the first couple of verses in the book. Uh, the spirit you have hovering over the waters, you have Jesus saying, let there be light, and obviously you have God introduced. So you have the Trinity in Genesis 1, and you have each of them being involved in the creation of man, which goes into chapter 2, because you have uh, the body, soul, and spirit of man in Genesis 2-7. So, and that, that's the triune being, God, the keeper of souls, the flesh goes to Jesus being God in the flesh, and obviously God breathed into his nostrils. The breath of God is the spirit of God. So, uh, direct creation number one is Adam, direct creation number two is Jesus. The only two direct creations of God, well, Eve, I mean, but the two men uh, were, were the first Adam and the second Adam, which we learn about in 1 Corinthians 15. So, you have uh, all three parts of the Godhead being involved in the assembly, <laughs> as it were, of mankind. Um, and Help Meet for Him talks about Eve and how she was uh, introduced in, in Chapter 2. So then Creation Week is con concluded. Talk about the, a murder from the beginning going into Genesis 3. And original sin, how they entered the, wor the world, knowing good from evil, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, was the one law that God gave to Adam. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, lest you die. Now, that command was given before Eve was created. It was given specifically to Adam by God. So Adam was responsible, ultimately, for sin entering the world. 
because he was the one to whom God covenanted, with whom God covenanted, and to whom the command was given not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The seed of the woman, ultimately, after sin entered the world, would, uh, would be Jesus Christ, the second Adam, through whom redemption would occur, would be offered. Through one man's sin, uh, death entered the world, and then obviously Jesus, the second Adam, came to repair the broken relationship that the first Adam's sin created and bring, come, uh, offer that way back to God. So you have the first Adam from perfection to the fall, and the second Adam from fall back to perfection, which is where, as a result of God's perfect love, he created this his way back to him. He created restitution for mankind. And the, the uh, sacrifice of the lamb in the garden to clothe Adam and Eve with skins. Because they tried to do it on their own. They tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. That didn't work. It was insufficient to save, insufficient to cover sin. We are told in the New Testament that love covers a multitude of sins. It was because of God's love that he did all of this. The, the sacrifice to clothe them with the skins of the lamb, God's sacrifice, God clothed them, was foreshadowing God's plan of redemption that God himself would author and finish, and all we have to do is accept it. The marriage covenant, I actually talked about this in the book Truth in Defense of the Preacher of Rapture, um, but I also talk about it here because it's relevant. We are probably in large part familiar with the marriage covenant between the second Adam and the church, Jesus and the church, and how each of these steps relates to things that, that the church can look forward to as a result of repairing this broken relationship, looking to Christ to repair the broken relationship. But what few fewer people may know is that the same marriage covenant exists between God and Adam, that these steps are in the garden between this covenant with God and Adam. And they're reversed. You have the from fall back to perfection between Christ and the church. But in the garden, you have the reverse of those steps between God and Adam from perfection to the fall. So uh, those are both marriage covenants. The first between God and Adam, the second between Christ and the church. Uh, there's a few other things that are in here that I won't go through, but I think in large part I covered that. So it was interesting to write. I, as always, I enjoyed it. I learned a lot. And uh, that was book eight called In the Spotlight, volume three, in the beginning. And uh, it was about the same size as both of the other two combined. Uh, they were about 40 pages each, so this was about 80 because it went through three chapters, not just one or a large selection of verses. So that was book number nine um, in the Spotlight, Volume 3. In the beginning, goes through Genesis 1 through 3. The next two I'm going to talk about together, books 10 and 11, because they're shorter, they're topical studies. The first one is called A Power of Love of a Sound Mind, and the second one is called Eternal Security. Those are opposite sides of the same coin. Those are designed to bring peace, the first in daily life on a, on a micro level, the second on an eternal level, on a macro level. So let's talk about those together. And those are books 10 and 11, again called uh, A Power of Love and a Sound Mind, A Power of Love of a Sound Mind. And then the second one is called Eternal, Eternally Secure. So I'll talk about that in the next video. Stay tuned. Thanks, guys.